Now is the time. Don't let it get you by here. Like and subscribe now. Hi, hey everybody. How you doing? I'm your host, Brendan. Welcome to Swing Batter, the podcast. And I'm with the man, the myth, the legend, Peter Lemieux, also known as my father. How are you today, sir? I'm outstanding. Got a good night's sleep. What else can you want in life? I mean, I don't, there's a lot of things that people want in life. That's why they're unhappy. But if you're down to a good night's sleep, I know a lot of people who don't get that. Was that brought to you by Malanta? No, just watch a boring movie and they just say, please, let me go to bed. <laughs> That's all it takes. And our other host, the one, the only, Todd Lemieux. How are you doing, sir? Ah, I'm so mellow. Here we are in the lull before the storm. We have nothing going on this week. We're just waiting for the Super Bowl to happen, and then we'll dive right into pitchers and catchers. I know baseball's going on. Hockey had its all-star game. There's just not a lot going on in the sports world. It's all lulling us into a false sense of security before the chaos erupts. I didn't understand hockey all-star game. It said there were three games. Yeah, I didn't understand that either. I don't know. Freshman it's all very confusing. Freshman well, JV and varsity? No, it's the Canadian Hall All-Star game. It's just, you know how the dollar and Canadian dollar, it's different? Like most Hall All-Star games are like one game. The Canadian All-Star game is three games because it's a Canadian sport. So they have to, something where it gets worked in by Canadian standards. Yeah, well, you, you got to do what you have to do in hockey to more confuse people because they already can't see the puck. So you might as well have... Six teams for an all-star game and have everybody really confused. I would go for that in basketball as well. You can have like eight teams of basketball do a tournament in the all-star game. First one to 21 wins. You keep going on. That'd be fun. Anyways, here we are at Swing Batter. We are here with uh, Dad and uh, we're happy to to present the uh, th rounding third. So Swing Batter presents rounding third here with, uh, with my father. These are stories from his heart that are near and dear to him near and dear, and uh, they are reminders that we like to walk through with him and see how it reminds us of today or yesteryear or as uh, kids growing up with our dad. So, uh, Dad, we look forward to it. What do you have for uh, rounding third today? Today today I got a little um, story that really got three parts. Um, the first part, I want to give a little history on swing batter. <laughs> then I want to talk about the player. I want to close by talking about the city the player played in because it's part of the whole thing. Uh, well over a year ago, we were lamenting, as every baseball fan does, about how our favorite team spends money on players who don't perform. That was the birth of swing batter. We did a lot of research on contracts that were given to players who just didn't perform after getting a big contract. We developed quite a library of what we call swing batter contracts. So we're going to talk about one of the biggest ones today. But before we do that, time for a flaming hot Cheeto, which will be featured at our house during our Super Bowl party. So far, no one's been invited, but me and a bag of flaming hot. So, so far, that, that's where we're at. I want to start our story with a guy named Ryan Howard. Convergence, viral marketing. We're going guerrilla. We're taking it to the streets while keeping an eye on the street, Wall Street. I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. In other words, it is what it is. Not that Ryan Howard. I'm going to talk about the baseball playing Ryan Howard. Um, Ryan Howard has did some absolutely amazing things which gave him a huge contract i i don't know unless you were i've got a great memory or you're a philadelphia philly fan you may not be aware of what this guy did at the beginning of his career first of all he came up in 2005 and won the rookie of the year while only playing in 88 games he managed 28 home runs 288 batting average and 63 runs batted in and he won the rookie of the year award that was in 2005 however going to run through some statistics here to just make a point from 2006 to 2009 
Ryan Howard put up the most amazing numbers. If you consider bringing runners in, runs batted in, important in a game, and home runs, Ryan Howard had staggering numbers. In 2006, he batted 313. He had 58 home runs and drove in 149 RBIs. I mean, it's almost 150 RBIs and almost 60 home runs. Um, now, I want to give you some historical context here. You would immediately think the guy's on steroids, except Barry Bonds had retired. Sosa and McGuire were out of the game. The Mitchell report had come out, and these guys were getting tested constantly. Never in Ryan Howard's career was it ever suggested that he ever took steroids. So when you factor that in, this was an incredible season. And um, I'm pretty sure he won most valuable player. If he didn't, he should have. But that was just the beginning of four staggeringly great years for Ryan Howard. Now, his batting average dipped. In 2007, he only hit 268. However, 47 home runs and 136 RBIs. 2008, his batting average went down again to 251, 48 home runs, and 146 RBIs. And finally, in his fourth year of 2009, he got his average up to 279 with 45 home runs and 141 RBIs. He never, in those four years, drove in less than 136 runs in a season. He just was a monster at producing. Now, the most important thing to a city is to win a World Series. Now, I know the world, the Phillies are in the World Series last year. Now they're in a Super Bowl. It's a great time for Philadelphia. Back in this time, Philadelphia didn't have winning teams. Yet, in 2008, and 2009, the Phillies went to the World Series, winning it in 2008. In 2008, Ryan Howard hit three home runs in a five-game series, and they won the World Series. Ticker tape parade in the city of Philadelphia, to, um, up to that date, there had never been so many people out to cheer an event. No violence celebration, people in Philadelphia to this day say it was one of the most glorious days of their lives. In 2009, led by Ryan Howard, they made it to the World Series, but didn't win it. Um, he was the quickest player in baseball history to get to 250 home runs. Now, in 2010 and 2011, um, he dropped off a little bit. 33 home runs, 31 home runs, but still 108 and 116 RBIs. However, you could tell he was not doing so well as he started to strike out more. And in 2011, he did only bat 219. It's not Ryan Howard's fault that at that time, going into 2012 season, the Phillies wanted to reward their hero with a five-year, 100 and, pardon me, six years, $135 million contract. At the time, that was immense. Now, I have read some things that said one of the things that hurt Ryan Howard's batting average was the shift came in. And people believed for a pull hitter like Ryan Howard, the shift probably cost him about 20 points off his batting average. But after 2012, right after he signed the contract, everything went wrong for Ryan Howard. First, he tore his Achilles tendon. Okay? Then the next year, he tore a meniscus. It reduced his playing time immensely, both in 2012 in 2013, when he only hit 14 and 11 home runs, but he was seriously injured. Um, he had become, however, 
in 2014, he drove in his 1,000th run, and he was the first player to get to 2,000 to 1,000 RBIs at his age. So he got there very quickly. However, in 2014, after two years of injuries, he led the league in strikeouts, hit 23 home runs. Interestingly enough, he did drive in 95 runs. In 2015, he led the league in strikeouts again, and his RBIs dropped to 77. Finally, in 2016, which was the fourth of a six-year contract, he was benched and then released the Phillies eating the last two years of his contracts. He signed with the Braves, but he wasn't very good there, and he, re he was released from the Braves. So if you just want to talk about money flow, which is what we do at Swing Batter, Ryan Howard got $135 million for virtually leading the league in strikeouts for three or four years. Uh, got some runs batted in, but it wasn't good. Which gets me to the final part of my story. This happened in the city of Philadelphia. Now, what we know about Philadelphia, I'm not from Philadelphia, but they once booed Santa Claus, okay? They <laughs> don't like it when things don't perform. He, they would go to the games, and they would start to lose, and here's their big home run hitter, RBI guy, striking out, batting 220. And Ryan Howard got killed. For four years, when he was making all his money, he was booed constantly. One time, even had a bottle thrown at him by the same fans who were worshiping him five years earlier. And so it ended in a completely horrible situation for Ryan Howard and his family. But he's got money to last for generations because of what he did. When we look at him, we're not talking about a Hall of Fame guy here, but we are looking at four years that just are mind-boggling with how many runs that guy was able to bring in. Then when you bring in the shift and his injuries, it wasn't there. The Phillies should have seen it coming. It wasn't Ryan Howard's fault that they wanted to throw money at him. But the two years prior to 2012, you could see the drop off. Yet even though he only batted 219, they came forward and offered him all that money. The consequence was Ryan Howard lived his last days playing baseball in Philadelphia as a complete and total villain, where he was just booed, had things thrown at him. His family couldn't go out because if they recognized that I was Ryan Howard's family, man, people would just hate him. So it's it's the interesting thing about human behavior. When we have a swing batter contract that just throws money at a guy who doesn't perform, it's a waste of money for the team. But the expectations from the fans when they see that money is they expect to see a guy go out and just light it up. And when he does it, it's merciful and worst city in the world to have that happen is Philadelphia. So the Ryan Howard story is a classic swing batter contract, but finishing in, in darkness for Ryan Howard. But really, in the end, was it Ryan Howard's fault? It was a Phillies. Man, you want to give that guy $135 million when his batting average was 219 so that's the story that I have for today about Ryan Howard. What? So stay classy, Philly. And uh, Jalen Hurts, just remember this: if you don't bring home some trophy in the uh, in the big game. So with him getting injured, I always felt like his mechanics changed because of the injuries, right? It, you you just physically something had to give there. Um, and so, and then you start overcompensating because Brennan, you talk about this all the time. Like they feel like they have to earn the contract after they sign it. Um, and you know, he comes back from the injury, feels like he's got to make up for it. And he just completely sacrifices average to try to get some sort of power all the time to get back to those four years. 
That that to me was what I felt like was, was the most tragic part of all that. I read yeah. an article in preparing for this by a writer named Liz, I think a Sokol or something like that. She's from Philadelphia, and she's used to going to the ballparks and hearing the boos. And she said, you know, some of the guys deserve it, but she could never bring it in her heart to boo Ryan Howard because she remembered his great years. And she thought that that was wrong to do that. And she wrote this compassionate article. But, I, you know, as I read about Ryan Howard during his four years, a lot of amazing things he did, as you can imagine. I'll just tell you one quick one. He got food poisoning while eating at a White Castle. <laughs> so the next day he was sick and they put him on the bench and he just was feeling weak and horrible. And they were trailing one to nothing in the eighth inning. And the manager said to him, can you give me an at bat? He says, I'll try against the Cincinnati Reds. He came up and he hits a home run one to one. So then the manager says, can you just try to play the extra innings? In the 12th, he hits another home run <laughs> and they win the game two to one. And at the end of the game with two outs, Ken Griffey came up and hit a screaming line drive right at Howard. He caught the ball and he said, this is so ironic. I caught a line drive from my favorite player. <laughs> he was a huge fan of Ken Griffey, but he had come off the bench sick, hit two home runs and won the game for the Phillies. But that's how magical those four years were for him. Uh, his first year was rookie of the year, then four great years. It, it, it just looked like this guy could do no wrong. Yeah, I would even I would even argue that the the five years because his run doesn't end. His four years are magnificent, and then he has thirty one home runs, one hundred eight RBIs, and thirty three home runs. You know, one hundred and sixteen RBIs, which in today's standard for a first baseman is freaking that's a great. Yeah. I mean, we're we're good. We're going. Nobody does that. We're losing our mind about Vlad Guerrero Jr. And I mean, he is fantastic. But again, those six years combined. I mean, his career average in home runs is 39. That's with those injuries. And his last five years, he didn't hit over 25 home runs. So that's how crazy his six-year tenure was to average 39 home runs in his career in a season. Actually, Brendan, if you compare Ryan Howard, I just brought this up, Ryan Howard's four years that you, or actually the five years that you talked about, 2006 through 2010, and you compare them to Vlad Jr.'s 2019 through 2022, um, the big difference, Ryan Howard struck out 922 times. Oh, you... Vlad, Vlad, Vlad Jr., 310. But Ryan Howard had, 120, had 229 home runs. Vlad Jr. had 104. Yeah, it's... But also the... Ba batting averages are similar. Batting averages are 278 and 284. Um, on base percentage, 374, 358, slugging 573, 504, and OPS is, uh, you know, uh, 9, 947 to 862. What's but, the RBI comparison? RBI. It, Ryan Howard had 680 RBIs. 680 RBIs. Vlad Jr. has had 310. That's, that's, those are, that's money. That's just money. Um, it, again, when we were talking, you know, Albert Bell is the fourth spot. He just does his job every time. He never really had a, a tail, a tail off, if you will, like Ryan Howard did. And right. they, that's the other thing about the body. I mean, everyone well, has. Well, Ryan Howard did play two hundred and sixty more games for probably for various reasons, right? You had COVID right. and and all that stuff in there. But but if you want to take four a four year comparison at the beginning of their career, that's it. It's hard to yeah, believe I, many people had four years like that. In fact, I did a search, and he, he they were saying like the only people that drove in had 58 home runs and 149 RBIs. There were only two people that had that number. One was Babe Ruth, and the other one was Sammy Sosa, who did it with you know with steroids. So it's it's not a fair comparison. And court right. bat, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, he, he was, and he, and again, he the whole city loved him, and he was he was a threat the whole time when he was up. But again, yes, he's a strikeout guy. He did strike out a ton during those six years. And yeah, you know, thinking about that, isn't that amazing that he had such a high on base percentage with strikeouts like that? 
I mean, yeah. when he wasn't striking out, he was getting at base. I mean, when you're well, having... Barry Bonds between 2000 and 2004 was close. He was close. He had 544 RBIs. Uh, you know, Howard at 680. Yeah. Um, Think about the reason that I brought up Howard is this was after the Mitchell report and Howard wasn't juiced. So well, he, that's remarkable. And the fact that, you know, Barry Bonds had for he had over 130, 136 more RBIs than Barry Bonds in that time period. And that was the time period when Barry Bonds just dominated. Yeah. Yeah, that's just dominated. And and the sad part to me, we had it happen in Arizona. Matt Williams was on the team that won the World Series. Matt Williams got old. And at the end of his career, he was not good. And we would watch games. I know Brendan and I would watch games. And the pitch is going to be outside and it's going to curve. It's curve ball going down the left side of the plate. It's going to curve out of, out of the strike zone. He's going to swing at it all day long striking out and then we just didn't want him to play anymore because he was hurting the team and they finally just peddled him away and you know what do you do when someone loses it but when you the guy is making that much money and the fans who are working hard to pay their light bill and they just are brutal on him they like the money's his fault you know but they right. they ryan howard did not have any fun at the end of his career. You know who who is an interesting comparison because we're talking about swing batter contracts. Another one that we always highlight as well is Mo Vaughn. And Mo Vaughn oh, yeah. with Boston in his in his early, you know, late twenties, he was a tear. He was lighting it up for the Boston Red Sox in a similar fashion. You know, high on strikeouts, high on RBIs. He was really really good. And you forget how good Mo Vaughn was because the end of his career was such a drop. And it was not even a slight drag or a drop. So I would, if you are going to give any advice to someone in their 20s, when you're carrying the extra weight that you as a player has, and you're putting that much torque on a swing, because again, Mo Vaughn and Ryan Howard had pure power. And they were quick bats. Lots of torque on the legs. They had two injuries for Ryan Howard. Movon was the same way. Lower body injuries destroyed their abilities. It's and insane how similar their stats were between 26 and 30 years old. It's very eerie. And both of them got massive contracts and yep. massive extensions for a long period of time. And they dropped off early. In their well, lobbies. we did see that trend with first baseman and weight is Prince Fielder has to go oh, out too. Yeah, they had amazing yeah. numbers in Detroit. Then they traded him to Texas, and you know he he couldn't do it anymore. So, yeah, and that was a, that was a very sad injury with his neck and back. It was oh. just, I mean, you you couldn't play baseball anymore. It's for longevity, especially now that teams are signing these players. Um, it's very it's very interesting because I would argue that Vlad Guerrero Jr. has extra weight. That if you were to say what was the one thing to keep him going for a long term career would be to lose to lose weight, to lose that um, that extra that extra weight that hurts your torque. Um, as you get older, when you're young like he is right now, you feel nothing. It's fantastic. Twenties athlete prime, you're good. So, but even like it, I'm sorry. Let's Even like guys relevant, relevant for today. We got all these people with these huge contracts that just got signed as free agents. I'm going to tell you, there's a whole bunch of these people that are going to be hated when they don't perform. They're going to get booed. They're going to be. It's going to be awful when. They, now, what do I care? I, I'm rich for the rest of my life. You know, I don't care about the fans. But that that contract hangs over your head. They. Fans expect performance, and they're not all going to perform. Well, I, I would I, like I like people listening to this to tell us who do you know on your team that didn't perform after a big contract? Who do you think's going to fail this year? The, the beautiful thing, if you're an owner, is that people forget those contracts. They sign it that year, that first year, everyone remembers. But as it goes on, 
they tend to forget they're looking at the team and who's good or bad. They don't look at dead money. They don't look at dollars that are being spent on players that are no longer with the team. You know, Chris Davis, for instance, in Baltimore, do you think they even bring that up right now? They're excited about their young team. I mean, but you could look at that and say your owner's still spending money on Chris Davis. What's the point? You have a lot of those guys. I mean, we could easily come up with quite a few this year right away that's going to have a lot of pressure. And there's a lot of pressure on those GMs and owners who are coming out saying to uh, to Texas's point, everyone's giving them A ratings in the offseason for all of the signings they did for to address their pitching staff. They had a pitching staff issue last year. They didn't have it. So they addressed it by signing all of these pitchers in the hopes that their pitching staff will now be solidified and more consistent. However, every single one, like we've talked about, is a risk. There's not a single signing that they have. Like Justin Verlander would have been even a risk, but he's still more solid than the the individuals they signed based on innings pitched for the year. So, but stay, stay off pitchers for a second because I think you can take this and really focus on batters, right? Who were the batters that performed comparably between the ages of 26 and 30? that are primed for a drop-off due to injury because of the physical toll they've taken on their body, right? And we've mentioned four so far that if you look them up, Ryan Howard, Mo Vaughn, Prince Fielder, and Chris Davis, between the ages of 26 and 30, all lighten it up in the RBI department, all, well, Prince Fielder not uh, flirting with 200 home runs, but all but three of those guys flirting with 200 home runs, Ryan Howard at 229, uh, Mo Vaughn at 184, uh, Chris Davis at 197, and then Prince Fielder at 128. All of them known for having dramatic drop-offs after that, you know, right around that 30-year, 30th birthday. So I'm not looking at it right now, but who are who are the signings that have happened in this offseason? Guys are in their 30s, right? Who maybe are at the precipice, but it, because I think a lot of the physical training has probably changed since that time, right? Because Prince Fielder, his father, Cecil, um, you had, uh, you know, Ryan Howard, who, listen, Ryan Howard had 20 triples during these seasons. It wasn't like the guy wasn't moving, um, but I just keep going to the body types now are so dramatically different. Maybe Vlad Guerrero Jr. fits in that mold of the type of the, the, the heavy set, uh, Pete Alonzo, um, I'm going to take, John, listen, he's my boy, but that guy's primed. That guy physically is primed with the torque that he's putting on his body after age 30 to have, he's on this trajectory right now. Um, One of the small signings was Bell, Josh Bell. He has some you know, first baseman with, you know, a little bit extra weight. He has a two-year deal that he signed with Cleveland, which I think is a great deal, but he's 30. He's right there at that age. Uh, so yeah, you're, you're right. The thing that I'm noticing this year that is different, um, is the shortstops. This was a big money year for shortstops and they're signed for a very long time. And one of the biggest issues with the shortstop is range. I, as an owner would want a younger shortstop. I think 20 in your twenties to early thirties is a shortstop position. I thought Derek Jeter stayed on shortstop for a very long time. He didn't have the range that he, you know, a, another younger shortstop would have. However, he had the allure and it, the teams were were fantastic. And they, you know, they ha- everyone appreciated what he brought to the table. But if you're a 35-year-old shortstop and you're competing with a 25-year-old shortstop who's coming up in the minors, and these guys are signed until their late 30s, you can love them all you want today. And you may get three to five years out of them. And that's really, really good. But shortstop position, you're turning double plays. You got, again, we've done a lot to make safety happen. But one of the things we just did is we said no more pickoffs besides two. You unlo- you made the bases bigger, which in my opinion is going to be more stolen bases. More stolen bases put shortstop and second baseman in harm's way because they're going to get s- slid into. And I've seen these guys get hurt and taken out and what have you. So these are long, 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 no, long Only if you have Chase Utley sliding into second base. Again, <laughs> another Philly, just a characteristic of Philly. I, I'm I'm telling you, I'm just calling it like it is. Philly, Philly's going to Philly. 
So unless Chase Utley's your base runner or whatever, I, I don't think many shortstops, because you can't take out the shortstop and second baseman anymore because of what Utley did. So I don't think that that risk is there. I think the body type is totally different. I, I disagree with you because you had, first of all, you had Ripken setting the record that he did. You had Jeter playing for as long as he did. The, you had A-Rod playing as long as he did. It's just a different body type. And I think if you look at the body type and what these guys start thinking mentally they have to do is they got to pound home runs. If they're thinking they got to pound home runs all the time, yeah, that's gonna that seems to be the indicator that there's going to be a fall off if they start getting sucked into that mindset. <laughs> I don't. I don't know that second baseman or or and, and shortstops are are at, at that point, right? I I don't know I, if they're there. I'm just telling you for the longevity, just from a standpoint of how long they were signed. It was a very long time. As far as the rounding third story, um, Ryan Howard brings up great memories of first baseman who just mashed, and in an era where it was exciting to watch through first baseman, you know. The Freddie Freeman, for instance, is not the same as a Mo Vaughn. I still remember being excited about watching Ryan Howard come up to the plate because you knew all it took was one bad pitch and the game was going to be tied. It's like watching a Bryce Harper today, for instance. There's just those special players that could just change the, alter the game. I know everyone swings for home runs nowadays, but in that era, you had like, Mo Vaughn, I mean, his home runs, he would crush that. Ryan Howard would crush the ball. Like, his distances, I mean, these were no doubters forever. So these these power first basemen with that weight and that and that torque, off oh, the power they got, destroying that his, baseball. His swing was great. It was like Daryl Strawberry, Ken Griffey, like that underhanded, left-handed, like just power swing. It was beautiful. It was yeah. beautiful. I would agree. I I would, and again, we we went we we look at contracts as uh, Dad said about swing batter. We don't look at it from a standpoint of shame on the player. We look at it more of what was delivered based on the team. And on this instance, one of the things we factor in is you were rewarding a player who brought you a World Series. And not only did he bring you the World Series, he was he performed fantastically in the playoffs. And there's a lot of players who can't say that. And I can, if Philadelphia Phillies fans look back at those playoffs, I guarantee you they have a warm heart for Ryan Howard and how he did. And if they brought him back today, Dad, not only would they not boo him, they would give him a standing ovation and people would wear their jerseys to the game. They, he brings such wonderful memories to that town now. And that's part of the booing problem is you remember what he used to be able to do and he can't do that. And it's frustrating as a fan because you're looking at the money and the dollars. But Looking back at his Because from a fan's perspective, there, there's no loyalty. They don't care anyway, right? DeGrom never got booed. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> he never got booed. Well, so he hasn't pitched there as a ranger yet. Yeah, you know, well, <laughs> we'll see We'll see what happens. You know? chances, of, chances of that are pretty low, just saying. Dad, any f- closing thoughts on our rounding third story? Well, I'd like I'd like great... to hear from our listeners. What I'd like to hear from our listeners to tell us uh, other people that they've had on their teams that got signed for a lot of money and then just didn't show up. So that would be good, uh, very helpful. Very good, Todd. Any closing thoughts for Mister Ryan Howard? Loved watching him play for those four or five years, even though he beat up on the Mets pretty hard. But uh, you know. Look, at the end of the day, you know, fans are going to do what the fans are going to do. You know, you're there to watch people perform and you can be a hero one day and and you could not be a hero the next day. I know goat's got a different meaning now. You go from hero to goat. But, uh, you know, you, you're there to perform. Be careful when you sign that contract, baby. Expectations are coming. I'll drop one name for all the fans out there of one signing that occurred not a very long signing, but could have a drop-off, and that was uh, Mr. Rizzo with the Yankees. Always been a little bit bigger, signed a two-year deal. He's batting with that great team of Stanton and Judge, but his numbers have kind of gone a little bit down. I still think he's fantastic, but does he last? Does he have the longevity? We shall see. So leave your comments. Uh, thanks for your likes. Thanks for the subscriptions, and we appreciate it. That's all we have for this show on Rounding Third. Thanks, everybody. I'm your host, Brendan. Have a great day.
Have a good one.